They are elected by you. I am elected by you. I'm constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place. The founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is, uh, structure is destiny. destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article One Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. On November 11, 2022, U.S. Senator Mike Lee of Utah delivered remarks to the Federal Society's National Lawyers Convention. The following is the audio of his address. Good morning. I apologize about my voice. <clears throat> my name is Nate Kasberic. I am Vice President and Director of the Practice Groups and the Article One Initiative for the Federal Society. It is certainly my honor to introduce our speaker for our morning address. No question. Uh, the senator from Utah is known well to this audience, and I doubt that I could add much in, in the way of fun facts or previously undisclosed biographical details about his distinguished career and his service to our country. What I can say is that I once worked on Capitol Hill, and while there are many good public servants within the legislature, the phrase, jack of all trades, master of none, was very often the most charitable characterization that came to mind when observing some of our nation's representatives up close. But not so with Senator Mike Lee. In fact, uh, the Senator has always been generous to the society with his masterful understanding of our system of government and his formidable legal expertise, which he says was instilled at a young age around the dinner table by his father, Rex Lee, the former Solicitor General of the United States. A quick search of the Federal Society's website this morning demonstrates that he has offered his views to us on a wide range of issues and has always done so with considerable wisdom and insight. Most recently, the list of events includes subjects as his new book, Saving Nine, the fight against the left's audacious plan to pack the Supreme Court and destroy American liberty. By the way, if you go to the Federal Society's Instagram page, there is a link there to be entered into a drawing to receive a signed copy of the book from the Senator. He's also spoken to us recently about uh, regulation by surrogate. Is the government evading the Administrative Procedure Act? The policy and process of federal judicial appointments the Founding Fathers, big government, forgotten historical hero heroes, the role of Congress, American exceptionalism, fidelity to the Constitution, Robert Bork's antitrust paradis, par paradox, and the list goes on. In addition to all of that, did you know that in the last two years, he sat down with our Article One initiative and created a fascinating and educational 16 episode video series focused on Article I of our Constitution called the Constitution Line by Line. Uh, with his steady guidance, this series walks audiences through every word of the document and offers his unique reflections as a lifelong admirer and student of the Constitution. These videos have now been viewed more than 300,000 times. If you haven't watched it yet, I invite those you, of you here in person to check it out and the many viewers who are joining us uh, by live stream. Um, you can watch the series on the Federal Society's YouTube page. This morning, we have invited the center to offer remarks related to our convention theme, and we are delighted that he could carve out time from his schedule to join us. With that, please join me in warmly welcoming the senior senator for the state of Utah, Senator Mike Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, this marks the absolute first time that has ever happened in the city of Washington to me, so thank you. <laughs> I, I, I love this uh, conference. Um, the Federalist Society has been an important part of my life. 
since before I was even a lawyer, I sometimes joked, although it's a true story, I actually organized my, my first Federalist Society event was when I was in high school. I, uh, naturally, I was the president of the Teenage Republican Club, and um, we organized a field trip uh, to uh, BYU Law School uh, uh, when I was in high school to go hear Judge Robert Bork speak. It was, it was fantastic. And uh, incidentally, uh, doing stuff like that, activities like that, it was a good way to make girls like you in high school. They really were. <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, I, I, I found one actually in, in high school uh, who, who liked me. She's here with me today. Wave to everyone, Sharon. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, our, our former president uh, loves, loves Sharon, loves, uh, loves talking to Sharon. Uh, she, he thinks she, uh, she's great, which of course she is. One time I, w I was with him over at the White House, and he asked me a question. I won't bore you with the details. It took way too long, would take too long to explain. It deviates from the uh, details of my speech today, but it, it was a very complicated question about the intricate interaction between the Constitution and the Senate rules. It was a strategic question. He wanted to know how he could engage in a particular maneuver. And, and, and I said, you know, that's fascinating I, and remarkably coincidental. I was just talking to one of my staff uh, members about this. Um, to answer your question, I would need a few hours, and I'd need to consult with a handful of experts on the Senate rules, and, uh, and I'd need a couple of, uh, of lawyers. And uh, he said, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, go talk to Johnny. Uh, I, I realized, okay, I guess that's what I'm doing for the rest of the day. So I convened uh, uh, the, the group of people I had in mind. It took me four or five hours. I was about to leave. It was getting dark. I was ready to go home. And I outlined it to, uh, this is Johnny McEntee, then the head of the Office of Presidential Personnel. Outlined it to him. We worked it out into 15 steps. And I thought, man, he's really going to be impressed, but I'm glad I don't have to explain it. Johnny said, no, I can't do this. You have to stay. You have to explain it. So I, I walked in. I thinking that he would have forgotten about it and gotten distracted. It was a really boring, uh, arcane question. He sees me coming back in. Oh, good, I've been waiting. Come on in. <laughs> he starts pulling people in. Pence, Meadows, Kellyanne, everybody come on in. Mike's got an answer for us. And uh, all these White House staffers were, he had me sit down. He, they were all uh, lined up behind me and he's talking to me. What have you got? So I outlined it to him. It took me like 15 minutes. And uh, I was really proud of myself. And I was thinking he was uh, just going to bear his heart out to me. I'm thank you so thank you so much, Mike. Instead, he goes, Mike, when the rest of us were 16, we were out chasing girls and doing crazy, crazy stuff. But then I think about you. At 16, you're not doing that, Mike. You're at home, sitting at a desk, and you're studying the Senate rules of the Constitution. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, it's not far off. Yeah, it's kind of true. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I did like girls. In fact, that's where I met Sharon, and he goes, yeah, good point. He said, I knew it. I, I knew that was you. And then he turns around and he says to all the staff, and this is the critical part, and yet he has a beautiful wife. I don't understand. <laughs> also happy to have my son James with me. James, uh, James is clerking for Judge Thapar right now. Uh, James, like me, was the president of the BYU Federalist Society. And his twin brother, John, is now the president of the BYU Federalist Society. So it's a second religion in our home. What can I say? <laughs> so a few weeks ago, my former boss, Justice Alito, uh, g gave some outstanding remarks uh, that I believe relate perfectly to the theme of this conference. He was explaining the fact that something bad happens when we as a society can't tolerate speech, when we can't tolerate views that differ from our own. And it, it has an impact on all sorts of things that we might not imagine. 
He characterized speech on college campuses, including speech on university law school campuses, as uh, being in, a, in an abysmal state. He went on to say, quote, freedom of speech is essential. Colleges and universities should be setting an example, and law schools should be setting an example. For the universities, uh, because the adversarial system is based on the principle that the best way to get at the truth is to have strong presentation of opposing views. In fact, it, it's absolutely true, absolutely true in our chosen profession. You can't really get to the truth unless you have this opportunity, sort of like you can't cut anything with scissors that have only one blade. That's what allows us to get at the truth. That really is being tested right now. It's being tested as a result of a couple of features. Number one, we see the excessive accumulation of power in the hands of the few within government. Number two, we've seen uh, the American people be deceived as to the meaning and purpose of government. We've been asked to treat government as if it were some sort of omnipotent, omniscient force, an entity that can know what's just and true at every moment and always do that thing. We're asked to create an almost supernatural relationship with it, one in which we assume that it is right, even when many expect us not to criticize it. We neglect the fact that it is just force. Government is force, and like, like fire, it's dangerous and it has to be controlled. It should never be trusted. As we lose sight of those things, and we lose an appreciation for the respect of polite civil discourse, we run into dangerous headwaters that could threaten and even undo the protections of our Constitution, and certainly pose a clear and present threat to the adversarial system, which is itself absolutely essential to safeguarding our individual liberties. Because if, after all, you get hauled in by this entity, whose sole purpose, entity meaning government, whose sole purpose is to exert force on you, to coerce you into doing or not doing a particular thing, if you don't have adequate representation, the adversarial system won't work. And if the adversarial system doesn't work, you will lose your rights, you will lose your liberty, potentially culminating in a full loss of life, liberty, and or property. This goes back to revolutionary times in America. It certainly goes back uh, as long as human beings and governments have existed. But in our own country, uh, just think about John Adams representing uh, those nine British soldiers. Now, this was not a popular set of clients to take on. And he knew that it wouldn't be, and it, 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 it lived up true to his expectations. He took a lot of heat for doing that. Uh, but he made note of the fact that it was absolutely necessary to do that at the time, uh, because the adversarial system and the duties of the profession required nothing less. In NAACP versus Alabama, we were given a glimpse into how this can be affected uh, by social trends that can tend to lead to people be effectively forfeiting their right to adequate representation. If through government coercive force, you can extract someone's confidential information, you can extract information regarding donor lists, regarding uh, the composition of your association, uh, specifically so that you can hold those individuals up for shame, ridicule, and scorn, bad things are going to end up happening. Now, fortunately, in that case, uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court of the United States said that, the, that these rights, that these rights of freedom of speech and freedom of association are, quote, indispensable to the preservation of freedom of association, particularly where a group espouses dissident beliefs. Uh, the, the right they were talking about there specifically was the, the right not to have to open the kimono, uh, uh, to make known to the entire world who was part of them, who joined them, who was supporting them, and so forth. Now, of course, sadly, NAACP versus Alabama didn't put an end to the discussion. It did for a while, for several decades following NAACP versus Alabama, with exceptions from time to time. I think American society generally supported the idea of maintaining the, the privacy, the integrity of the freedom of association. And the freedom of association, if you think about it, is about as much at the headwaters of all of our other rights, certainly all of our other First Amendment rights, 
and many of the other rights protected in the Bill of Rights, as you can think of. Uh, because so much of what we do as groups, as entities, what we do together, relates to other rights and protects us uh, so that uh, we can remind each other we, that we are not alone. And particularly, this is important when standing up to government. Uh, when we can assemble, uh, we can stand up to government more confidently. We can petition the government for a redress of our grie grievances uh, more effectively. For nearly all of us who are religious, it's also essential that we be able to assemble uh, in order to practice our religion. So you can't really have free speech or the access to a petition for the redress of grievances without the ability to assemble. And for most of us, you can't really uh, have uh, uh, religious freedom protections. They don't mean much because you can't practice. Uh, most, uh, most religions uh, reflected and represented in this room unless you do so as a group. So what changed? Well, COVID didn't help. It didn't help to put it really, really mildly because all of a sudden, where did they crack down the most on our ability to assemble? All of a sudden we were told, you know, you can't get together. I mean, shoot, a uh, church in Kentucky was told that it couldn't even hold a drive-through Easter service where people would drive through in their car. Uh, that's absolutely absurd. This took it way, way too far, and it extended into all, almost everything. This, in turn, led to people no longer being able or feeling confident being able to stand up to government to question government edicts uh, in the course of doing this. This has continued post-COVID. And it's gotten really ugly in the last year or two. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, had to intervene in uh, Americans for Prosperity versus Bonta. And, they, and it focused on the uh, requirements under California law requiring um, uh, disclosure, disclosure of some of the same things uh, for some of the same reasons, similar to what was presented in NAACP versus Alabama. And the court ended up invalidating that statute at issue in Bonta, uh, uh, concluding, quote, every demand that might chill association um, it, it w was at stake here. Uh, it w the, and, and so they sub subjected uh, to exacting scrutiny and found that the California statute failed under that exacting scrutiny. These rigorous disclosure laws that really were designed at the end of the day and would certainly have the effect at the end of the day of uh, chilling uh, the freedom of association and all the other incidental rights attached to that. Then just a uh, month or two ago, something really creepy happened in Alabama. Um, in, uh, in this case in Alabama, dealing with Alabama's Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act, the Department of Justice, uh, and this was uh, litigation surrounding a law passed by the Alabama legislature, uh, a lot dealing with uh, uh, transition of, of children uh, uh, experiencing gender identity issues. Um, the Department of Justice issued an, an abusive subpoena to a non-party to litigation regarding that statute. They issued it to the Eagle Forum of Alabama. And they, uh, the, the Department of Justice demanded access to all Eagle Forum's internal and external communications associated with the legislation. They wanted to know what Eagle Forum had been saying while this law was being considered by the Alabama legislature. They wanted to know what role they might have played in it. Now, thankfully, Judge, Judge Lyles Burke of the Northern District of Alabama recognized the Department of Justice's subpoena as a clear and present threat to the First Amendment rights of the Eagle Forum and of its members, calling the subpoena, quote, abusive discovery and lawfare at its worst. By the way, um, this was a, um, a really interesting case. I first became aware of this case before that abusive subpoena was issued. Uh, I became aware of it in connection with the confirmation proceedings 
of a woman named Nancy Abudu, who's been uh, nominated to serve on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. She has been serving as the D Director of Strategic uh, Litigation of one of the entities involved in that litigation. And they were engaging in some of the most rampant, blatant forum shopping uh, that I've ever seen. They filed it in a couple of district courts. Uh, they, they filed it in one district court and didn't, didn't get the judge that they wanted to get, so they filed it in another case. And then there were all these efforts to dismiss one suit and, and consolidate it with the other. And uh, uh, the, uh, it en ended up going uh, to the Northern District of Alabama. But this is an example of that kind of abuse. By the way, she still hasn't been confirmed. If you know any of my colleagues, particularly those on the Judiciary Committee, you might uh, talk to them about how odd it is that the Director of Strategic Litigation for an entity involved in litigation would claim under oath during her confirmation proceedings not to know anything about the litigation strategy going into filing multiple actions and engaging in blatant forum shopping that was later called out by both federal district courts involved in the litigation. As a result of all of these kinds of actions, and uh, you, you see all sorts of other things being chilled, um, look at what happened on September 23rd where you had um, FBI agents, FBI agents who weren't just wearing a suit, they were armed with long arms, ballistic shields, and a battering ram. They forced a man named Mark Houck uh, from his Pennsylvania home. They did so at gunpoint in front of his wife and in front of their seven children. Other peaceful pro-life protesters have received the same treatment over the past few months. This is how they deal with those who lawfully and peacefully exercise their free speech rights and their associational rights. They do so with an overwhelming show of force. Now, this is disgraceful. This is the sort of force we ordinarily reserve for really hardened criminals who are, are bent on imminent lawless conduct and violence. But at least government is reminding us here of what government at its core is. It's force. Government is, is, is forced with the potential of lawful violence under the imprimatur of government authority. And that is exactly why we need to restrain it. That's exactly why we need to restrict it. It's exactly why we need to restore an understanding of the Constitution. The Constitution, as my wife Sharon likes to uh, remind people, is, is uh, it's not there for the sunny days, or it's, at least it's not just there for the sunny days. It's there especially for the rainy days. It's there for the difficult days. It's there for the emergency moments because you don't ever want to let force with a badge operate in an unrestrained fashion. But the net impact of these sorts of things, uh, where, where there appear to be efforts selectively to target people based on their viewpoints, uh, is to chill speech. And ultimately, that has the inevitable effect of weakening the adversarial system. Because as we've seen all this happening, simultaneous to that, we've seen enormous pressure brought to bear on a number, number of institutions, including and especially our profession, where you've seen some prominent law firms, including some in this town, doing everything they can to shun certain clients, doing everything they can in some circumstances even to shun outstanding, remarkable lawyers based solely on their prior employment experience, including many who worked in the Trump administration. Whenever this happens, to whatever degree it happens, it weakens the adversarial system. But we as a profession can decide not to allow that. That can function if and only if uh, those who believe that way, those who believe it's important to shun that business and to shun those lawyers, if we refuse to accept their edicts, we can maintain the adversarial system. We can make sure that both of the blades on the scissors still function. It's up to us. And to be able to do that, we've got to be willing to represent the unpopular client, even when it's difficult. Even in many circumstances, when it might be an unpopular client with which we might strongly disagree. That's what we signed up for as lawyers, as officers of the court, and as people who claim allegiance to our constitutional system of government. 
Together we can stand up to this. We can keep this flame alive. We can make sure that the adversarial system is there to protect our rights and the rights of our posterity for generations to come. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. Um, uh, if there are any, you can ask me about law, politics, or uh, relationships, or fashion. <laughs> um, gardening tips, rock music lyrics from the 1970s and 80s, anything you want. Yes, sir. Uh, still morning. Good morning, Senator, and thank you uh, for visiting with us. I have a question for you because I would like to hold our society to the same standards that we would hold the other side which sometimes doesn't live up to those standards. Um, the other side often attacked President Trump's nominees for the positions they took, for the advice they gave him, for example, on immigration issues or whatever else. Luckily, most of them ultimately end up being confirmed. What I sometimes unfortunately see from our side, whether in the Senate or on a campaign trail, et cetera, is having liberal nominees who, you know, there's lots to disagree with them on, on a variety of issues, but attacked on the clients have represented, for example, taking on Gitmo detainees, people accused of horrendous crimes, etc. And given your remarks, which I wholly agree with, isn't that also a problem that we should work on on our side as well when we see liberal nominees or liberal candidates for attorney general or whatever else? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it, uh, it's a good question, and I, I tend to agree with that. Um, in the Judiciary Committee, you, you'll notice I generally don't oppose a nominee based solely on um, clients the nominee has represented. Um, even if uh, those clients have views that I disagree with, uh, my view is that everyone needs good representation. And so I, I, I don't think it's a good idea uh, to go after somebody on that. Usually, if you've got concerns, uh, as a US senator with a judicial nominee coming through, you're, you're much better served looking elsewhere than the client somebody has represented. Uh, there are sometimes uh, patterns that can ev evolve, or in some instances, if you've got a state attorney general up for a judicial position, you can look at some of the amicus briefs uh, that that person has filed. Sometimes those, because they're, they're more or less uh, deciding on their own what causes they want to take on. That's a little bit different than representing a client in traditional litigation. But yeah, I, I generally don't act, go after people based on their client list. I think that's repugnant. Hi, Senator. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so since you offered to let us ask about politics, uh, I'm going to. <laughs> we, we just had a midterm election, or, or rather. I our, heard. I heard. Our, <laughs> Or, or arguably are currently having one uh, in a few states. And a red wave was very much expected and, and what ended up happening can only best be described as a red trickle. So I would just ask, what described are Described as what? what? A red trickle. Um, so I would just ask, what do you think the party needs to do to reinvent itself in 2024 and what should be our takeaways from what just happened? Also, congratulations on your own re-election. Thank you. Thank you. Look, as Republicans, I think we're always at our best, and especially right now, when we offer contrasts, when we show how we're different than the other party. There is a tendency and a temptation in this town that some find overwhelming. Uh, to uh, make themselves more electable by moving themselves halfway, half the distance uh, to the other party. Uh, this doesn't end well because it turns out the other party is always moving left. And that also confuses voters. It doesn't give them a good reason to vote for us. I've always believed that w we would do well, especially as, as uh, Republican politicians seeking federal elected office, we will always do much better if we say, look, the federal government's too big and it's too expensive because it's doing too much stuff that it should never be doing. And here are the departments we would shut down. And here are the, the activities that we should allow 
to be pursued by state governments rather than the federal government, uh, uh, providing a fair amount of detail that shows how we're different than the other party. I, I think we win elections when we do that. We lose when we try to meet them half the distance of the goal. Yes. Uh, hey, Senator. I'm Bill Wichterman at Covington. Good to see you, Bill. Yeah, good to see you. Um, I'm tempted to ask you about fashion or rock music, or like the deplorable decline of rock music, music among the young, but instead I want to talk to you about epistemology, because I think your point about deliberation is really uh, an important one, and I think it's because of the underlying loss of a belief in truth, and where you have roughly 70% of Americans who don't believe that absolute truth is even a thing to be known, and as that becomes more and more ascendant in the culture, that people think, well, deliberation, the founders thought, was all about getting at a truth that existed, not creating a truth. And to the extent that we no longer think there is a truth that exists, then we would use government force to shut it down because it's all about asserting my truth. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, first of all, um, it's interesting how, because you, you, you're exactly right, Bill. Uh, I've sometimes wondered whether the Veritas uh, in Harvard's logo will eventually have quotation marks around it. Um, <laughs> Um, but the more we deviate from that, uh, the more we descend into chaos. And yet, in a cruel twist of irony, those who are most determined to put quotation marks around the word truth tend also to be the same people who will persecute us relentlessly uh, uh, based on the fact that we believe differently than they do. So apparently they do believe in some truth, but just not ours. And so I, I think we have to be ready to call that out. and also ready to call out those who deny the existence of the truth. I think there's something extraordinarily stupid going on in so much of academia today. And I think this is going to end up affecting a lot of academic institutions that have for centuries been respected. And I think what they're going to see is people will vote with their feet. Parents, some parents at least, will vote with their checkbooks and send their kids somewhere else uh, if they continue to deny the existence of truth. Yes. Oh, we've got two layers. Yeah, I was going to say in the back. Um, yeah. Senator, so uh, you've been a strong proponent for cutting the size and scope and, and intrusiveness of the federal government. And yet, for, for my entire lifetime, I think every single year the federal government has grown. It's grown under both Democrats and Republicans. Um, I, I recall an article, I can't remember where I saw it, under the last administration that suggested that suggested the former president would win with something like 70% of the vote if all he did was drive a wrecking ball through three or four federal agencies. Um, is there any hope for, for actually objectively shrinking the federal government rather than just slowing the, the size of its growth? Yeah. Uh, the, the short answer to your question is yes. I, I believe there is, but it is going to require legislative action and it will require us not to simply uh, rely on electing a president who can, for a period of years, uh, erect temporary uh, executive created walls. Uh, we need structural reform. And I've long said that if a genie appeared to me and said you can pass any one piece of legislation currently before the Congress, it would be the RAINS Act. And the reason it would be the RAINS Act, that's the one that says that uh, major rule regulations w uh, if it were passed, wouldn't take effect automatically. Congress would have to affirmatively enact them, and then the president would have to sign them into law. Uh, it's doing the right way what Congress tried to do the wrong way before uh, shut down in INS v. Chata with, INS, with legislative vetoes. Uh, no law in our republic should be made without um, the assent of the people's elected lawmakers. If you did that, the domino effect of that would be extraordinary, and we'd have our republic back. I think we should take Ilya next, and given that it's Ilya, I think it's the last question of the session. Um, well, I, I am going to ask about fashion, and I'm, I'm semi-serious oh, uh, about that. Uh, uh, whom are you wearing, and uh, if, if the Republicans uh, do take the Senate majority, will the Article I initiative be back in fashion? Um, I have no idea who I'm... Ah, uh, this is a Kenneth Cole model. <laughs> Nordstrom Rack, the time. <laughs> uh, um, okay. 
Yeah, if we get the majority, uh, and it's hard to say at this point whether we will. I mean, because the vote counting in, in Nevada and to some extent in Arizona, like, they're counting votes by sending each vote independently on the back of a mule up a mountain where it <laughs> has to be read by a shaman and, and then <laughs> handed over to a, an oracle. And then they fly it back on a carrier pigeon. Actually, it might be a, an African or a European swallow. Uh, <laughs> and, and, it's not really a matter of where he grips it, it's a question of weight ratios. Uh, anyway, so look, I think we could pull this off because I do think we're gonna win Nevada and I think we've got a decent shot. Yeah, I, and it's gonna be fantastic. I've been trying to talk Adam Laxalt into running for the Senate for a decade and finally happened, I think he's gonna win. And then between Arizona and Georgia, I think we win at least one of those. So if that happens, it'll be a tight majority, but a majority nonetheless. And I think um, if that happens, we must reinvigorate uh, the, uh, what I've referred to as the Article I project, the, the focus on Article I. It is the reason why our liberties are being destroyed. Like, the, people lose sight of the fact that the whole reason we have a constitution is to constrain government power and to prevent excessive accumulation of power in the hands of the few. In every single instance, uh, in every instance other than the, with the sole exception of the 13th Amendment, uh, which of course prohibits slavery. Every, every other provision of the Constitution restrains government action and not individual action. And we ignore this and we allow consolidation and accumulation of power left and right. And the only thing that can save, save conservatism, the only thing that can save our liberties at this point is if we're willing to acknowledge the fact that we lose liberty when we hand the power to make law over to anyone who is unelected and unaccountable. We especially lose liberty when we hand over power to someone who's not just unelected and unaccountable, but is also the same entity charged with enforcing the same laws that they can make up as they go along. And we're doing that because Congress is the fault. We are the culprit because we have, since the 1930s, increasingly moved toward passing legislation by platitude. We shall have good law in area X and we hereby delegate to commission or department or agency Y the power to make and enforce good law. That's crap. And we've got to acknowledge that it's crap. And that's why we've got to pass the Reins Act. That's why we need a regulatory budget act. That's why we need the Unshackle Act. There are about 10 legislative proposals that I've got ready to go. It, it's time for us to lock, load, and fire on this stuff because the administrative state must fall under our leadership. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article 1 initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.